Hello everyone and welcome to Algebra 2. This is section 9.5, graphing tangent and cotangent functions. So remember that whenever we have a graph that's new to us, the way we can always figure it out is simply to make a table. So we've been working on different values of tangent and we're going to start at zero. So if x is zero, y is zero. Tangent of zero is zero. Tangent of pi fourths is 1, and tangent of pi halves is undefined. Now we're just going to go all the way around the unit circle. Tangent of 3 pi fourths should still be 1 because its reference angle is pi fourths, but because of forecast, 3 pi fourths, which is in quadrant 2, tangent is negative. And then tangent of pi is 0, and tangent of 5 pi fourths. Now we're in quadrant 3, so it's still 1, but it's going to be positive again. Tangent of 3 pi halves is undefined. And tangent of 7 pi fourths is going to be negative 1 again, because 7 pi fourths is in quadrant 4, where tangent is negative. And now we've made it all the way back to the beginning of our unit circle, and tangent of 2 pi is 0. So what happens when something is undefined? Remember that tangent is sine over cosine. So at pi halves, we're actually talking about sine of pi halves, which is 1, over cosine of pi halves, which is 0. And you can't ever have the denominator be 0. So you may remember from rational functions that when the denominator is 0, there's an asymptote. So there is going to be an asymptote at pi halves, and then again at 3 pi halves. And as you know, trigon trigonometric functions are periodic, so I can keep drawing that asymptote at all the pi halves. That will always be the case. So let's plot our other points here. So tangent of 0 is 0, and then 1. And then 3 pi fourths is uh, negative 1, and then tangent of pi is 0. And then at 5 pi fourths, we're back up to 1. There's my undefined. And then 7 pi fourths is negative 1, and then 0. So hopefully you see enough of the pattern that you can go ahead and fill in the rest of the unit circle. And then we're going to draw it. It looks just like this. It looks very much like a cubic graph, except that it's tangent. And it repeats over and over and over again, where a cubic graph would just be one time. And of course, we can't keep going with that one. And this one, we would have come up there, and then it goes like that. There's our graph of tangent. So to graph cotangent, we could do the same thing. We could make a table and just start plotting points. But instead, I want you to think about cotangent a little bit differently. I hope that you remember when we were talking about sine and cosine, their graphs were off by 90 degrees. So our graph is going to switch by 90 degrees. So instead of having asymptotes at the pi halves, it's going to have asymptotes at pi, which is, like I said, it's a, it's a shift of pi halves. And then cotangent and tangent have a unique relationship that sine and cosine don't have. Not only are they off by 90 degrees, but it is the reciprocal of tangent. So in addition to shifting at 90 degrees, I'm also going to flip it upside down. And that's how I would draw cotangent. Not that you can't make a table. You'll get these exact same points if you do. But these are just two fun facts that might help you remember what cotangent looks like. And of course, as usual, you can make a bunch of points and then just connect them. So there are some facts that I'd like you to know about each of these two graphs. The first is that the domain of tangent of x, unlike sine and cosine, is not real all real numbers, but it's all real numbers except the odd multiples of pi halves. Notice it says odd multiples because that would include pi halves and then three pi halves, 
but it doesn't include two pi halves, which reduces to just pi. So that's how you can get it to go every other one. And of course, there's vertical asymptotes at those points. Where cotangent is has a domain of all real numbers except multiples of pi. So at all the pi's, there's going to be asymptotes. Um, the range of each function is all real numbers. So the function does not have a maximum or a minimum value. Therefore, it doesn't have an amplitude. Amplitude would, would mark how high and then low and then high and then low, but these just go all the way up. So no amplitude for tangent and cotangent. The period of each graph is pi. Remember, a period means how often something repeats. So once this gets from zero to pi, it starts over again. Where sine and cosine, it took, here's pi, it took until two pi before it started that same cycle over again but tangent and cotangent have a period of pi. And then of course, here's just a list of the x-intercepts for both tangent and cotangent, which is the reverse of where their asymptotes are. All right, so you know what we're gonna do. We're gonna make a bunch of graphs. So the first and hardest thing, of course, is this b, but we're gonna deal with it the same way that we did before. We're gonna take the period and we're gonna do pi over that number. B is one half. Now, last time we did two pi. How come I did pi this time? Because that's the period of tangent. Always think of it as the period over B. So if it's sine or cosine, you're going to use two pi. If it's tangent, you're going to use pi. And of course, I keep change flip, and now it's two pi. Now, what makes tangent a little harder to graph is that if I had a period of two pi for sine, I would start at zero and I'd end at two pi and I'd make my graph somewhere in there. But for tangent, the graph actually um, goes over, over the origin there and goes from negative pi halves to pi halves. So it does have a period of pi, but it doesn't start at zero and end at pi necessarily. I try and think of it as um, kind of being about the origin. So when I have a period of two pi, I say to myself, well, I'm gonna go about the origin, which means I need pi on this side and pi on this side. And that would give me a period of two pi. Now, normally it would be one right there, but that's too close. You'd have to spread it out, which is another reason why I sometimes teach it as like half of the half. So on this half, now you go up one. And on this half, now you go up one. But if you're ever not sure, you can just plug that point in. Think about it this way. Tangent of one half pi halves, when you actually plug it in, is tangent of pi fourths, which is one. So at pi halves, it's one. That one half is what affected everything. And then this is going to be what it looks like. And of course, I have to do it again over here. Although you're not going to see very much of this on either side, um, but it'll give you a concept of what it looks like. So I'd be coming up and then going like that. So I told you that tangent doesn't have a period or a uh, amplitude, and yet sometimes it's going to have a number in front of here. So what that's going to do is it's going to multiply each of the y values by three just like you're used to doing. You just don't have to call it an amplitude this time. So there's no period change. So I can go ahead and make my asymptotes at pi halves and negative pi halves. And then I usually just keep going all the way across. So now when I plot my points, zero times three is still zero, but one times three is one. And negative one times three is negative three. And that's what this would look like. That was terrible. Let me go ahead and draw it again. I, I find the steep tangents really hard to make, but you're coming up and then here's the little flex and then you're going up again. So if you don't get it right, don't just be like, oh, well, you really got to try and get it. Um, I think the hard part is if you try and start too far over, you'll have to make your flex at that first point, but it's very steep. So go ahead and just kind of come up to that point. This is your flex. That's where... We call that a point of inflection. So again, there's three, three. So I'm going to come up, make my point of inflection, and then I go up again. 
So you might have a little trouble drawing that. Um, make sure you practice it. Now I have two things going on. I have a change in period and I have not an amplitude, just I'm going to multiply all the y values by one half. So the period is the hardest part. Remember, it's just pi over three, not two pi like it is for sine and cosine. So I gave you a different graph. Now you know why, because my period is going to be pi thirds. So here's pi, one, two, three, two pi, one, two, three, three pi, and the same on the other side, negative pi, negative two pi, negative three pi. So tangent's entire period is only going to be pi thirds. That's one of these little boxes. So what's worse even now is that I have to split that little box in half because I want the whole period to be pi thirds. So I need half of pi thirds on this side and half of pi thirds on the other side. It is extraordinarily tempting to change your scale so that this is pi thirds and then two pi thirds and then this is pi. Well, you could do that. You could spread it out, but then you won't get the sense of how quick this graph is. It's going three times as fast. So it's important that you keep your scale the same for every problem that you do. Every time you have something that's counting by thirds, do one third, two thirds, three thirds. Okay, it's gonna be hard to draw. I'm gonna go, there's my zero, zero. And halfway between the zero and the asymptote, I'm gonna go up a half, only halfway. And then I'm going to draw it like this. There's my flex right at the zero. So of course the question that everybody wants to know is how many of these do I need to draw? Because they're very difficult. I would say as long as you drew at least a couple of them, I would be good. I do not need you to go all the way across the graph for something like this. So there's my one half but not just one, enough to show me that you can continue the pattern. So here's another one, because it's, it's tricky. There we go, and I'm just gonna do one more so that you can see how it's done. Okay, and it's good when you get it all in there, you're like, wow, that's really moving fast. That's what, it's going three times as fast as a normal tangent graph. Okay, let's do a cotangent graph. So cotangent also has a period of pi. So this one is going to be um, pi fourths, which again is very fast. Now remember that cotangent does start at zero. Tangent is the only one where you have to kind of surround the origin, but it's only gonna go until pi fourths. And it's upside down. There's my halfway. And then it's going to go from 1 to negative 1. It looks like that. Okay, so I only drew one to make sure that you can see it clearly, but now I am going to do at least a couple more on each side. So I go to 0, and then 1, negative 1, and it looks something like that. Again, very quick, four times as fast as a normal cotangent. So I didn't mention this the other day, but, you know, because there's a lot to learn right in the beginning. But another way that sometimes people think about the period is that this number also tells you the number of times um, it fits in a normal period. So normally, tangent goes from pi halves, which is a little difficult to show on here, right? Because it's halfway in between here. So it's going to be this one. There's, there's my half. Um, and then a negative one and a half of the three would be this one. And sure enough, how many do you see? One, two, three. And on this one, Cotangent normally goes from zero to pi. And if I kept drawing, how many would I be able to fit in there? One, two, three, four. 
for x. So that's another way when you're all done to check to make sure that you did it right. Okay, a couple more with cotangent. Remember that if it doesn't have a period change, cotangent is going to start at zero and have asymptotes at all the pi's. But this is only going to go one-third as high. So zero times one-third is still zero. But then one times one-third is just one-third, and negative one times one-third is negative one-third. So you're drawing it something like this. And in this case, I feel like those extra points gave us some ability to make a good shape. Sometimes it just makes it more difficult. But it allows us to come in and get that flex looking really good. Obviously, when there's no period change, or in my opinion, when there's a, a the period becomes bigger instead of smaller, it makes the graph easier. Those ones with the tight periods, that's pretty hard. So this one's only going to go half as fast. So normally cotangent is pi, but divided by half, it's going to be 2 pi. So that means you're going to start at 0, and you're not going to finish until 2 pi. So normally the 0 is right in between. It's still there. I just think of it as halfway. And then half of the half, it goes up to 1 and down to negative 1. So this is one where if you start too far over, you're going to want to flex there and see how you can really mess that up. So be careful that you come down and do that. I do think that the wider ones can be a little trickier to draw. And there's only two periods on here. Same thing here. It comes down. Here's my point of inflection. And then it goes down like that. Okay, that's cotangent. So I'm going to teach you two new ones. But before I do that, I want you to lightly draw the sine, the graph of sine of x. So hopefully you can do it pretty fast. Hopefully you're turning the video off, but in case you're still listening, um, sine starts at zero, ends at zero, and then the middle is at zero. And then the middle of the middle, it's up one and then down one. And then it does the exact same thing on the other side. Zero, 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 and it goes there and there. So because I said lightly, I am going to dot mine. That's going to make it look a little lighter. So we talked about how cotangent is the flip of tangent. Well, the flip of sine is cosecant. So if I flip sine upside down, I'm going to get cosecant of x. So in blue, I want to show you the graph of cosecant. It is literally the flip of sine. But of all the values of sine, what's the one number I can't flip? Sine can't be what if it's in the denominator? Zero. So every time sine is zero, cosecant is going to be undefined. So you're going to want to put asymptotes every time sine has a value of zero. But after that, I love graphing cosecant. You just flip it. Literally, you take this curve and you flip it up like that. It still touches it at 1 because the reciprocal of 1 is 1. Isn't it just a little bit fun? I kind of like it. And then like that. That is the graph of cosecant. But every time you want to draw graph cosecant, you just have to graph sine first. So you've practiced graphing sine. You go ahead and you graph sine, and then you just make the, make the u's, and you got yourself a cosecant graph. Based on that, I hope that you can totally, without me, graph secant. So y is equal to secant of x. What are you going to do first? You're going to graph cosine, and then you're going to flip it. All right, for those of you who are just checking or who did not want to turn the video off, um, remember that cosine starts at 1, ends at 1, in the middle it's at negative 1, and in the middle of the middle it's at zeros. Maybe a little crazy way to think of it, but really works for me. So I'm going to come like this and graph my, there's my cosecant, or my cosine. So now I'm going to graph secant, 
And everywhere where cosine is zero, I'm not gonna be able to flip that. You can't do one over zero. So this is where my asymptotes are gonna be. Right there. And now I can graph secant. I'm just gonna make a bunch of U's at one. It's still one. When you flip one, you still get one. And there, folks, is the graph of secant. You'll notice that the domain of secant and cosecant is all real numbers except where there's asymptotes. So pretty much except where cosine is equal to zero. And for cosecant, except where sine is equal to zero. So I never think about secant and cosecant on their own. I'm always thinking to myself, what are they are what they are in comparison to sine and cosine? Um, the range is really funny. It's going to be less than negative one or greater than one. Notice it never hits. It has a gap there, so it's less than or equal to one or greater than or equal to one, but it never hits a number in between. Um, and of course, the period is two pi. I'm just going to make a little note here that um, careful. It is not pi. Sometimes people think that it's pi because they make one U in the space of pi. But if I were to start the period over, I'd have to make another U here. It's up and then down before you've completed a full period. And that distance is 2 pi. So this is going to be really nice. We're going to graph a couple of secant and uh, cosecant graphs. But honestly, it's just like graphing sine and cosine. So if I were actually in school, I definitely would not show you another example. I would just say graph 2 cosine of x and then make a bunch of views. Graph 3 sine of x and then make a bunch of views. So you're really not doing anything new except adding another step at the end. But of course, I will do it for you. So I'm going to graph cosine, but... And I actually am going to write it down. I'm going to graph 2 cosine of x, which luckily doesn't shift or do anything complicated. Um, but it does have an amplitude of 2. So it's going to start at 2, end at 2. In the middle, it's negative 2. And in the middle of the middle, it's 0. And I would do the, I would do the entire thing. Um, possibly even, you know, if you've got a different colored pencil or something that you can use. You can tell I'm concentrating. Okay, so now that I've graphed that, you need to make two things. You need to do your asymptotes wherever the graph is equal to zero because you can't flip zero. And then you just need to make your use. Hopefully if you hadn't turned the video off, you are saying, okay, I can do that. And you're going to do the next one on your own. So the next one is 3 cosecant of x, but of course I'm going to real lightly think to myself, I'm going to do 3 sine of x first. So sine normally starts at 0, and 3 times 0 is still 0, ends at 0, and in the middle is 0. But where it's 1 at pi halves, it's going to go all the way up to 3, and then down to negative 3. And I would graph the entire thing. And let's say you didn't want to, um, let's say you didn't want to actually make the graph. You don't have to. As long as at the zeros, you realize that's where the asymptotes are going to go. And then once you have the asymptotes, and if you can picture, so if you don't actually want to do it, as long as you can picture that this is where it's going to be going, then you can just go ahead and not make the actual graph. So the green one's going to go up like this and then down like that. That, But I would at the very least make the points so that this can be accurate. It's not just a bunch of views, but maybe that'll help you see it better, that that's what it looks like. Okay, we've got two things going on now. I'm going to change the period. But again, don't let this freak you out do one half cosine of 3x. 
And then when you're all done, go back to secant. So this is only going to go, have an amplitude of half. It's only going to go up to a half. But this is the hard part. 2 pi over 3 is the period. Remember, it's always 2 pi over b. So that's why you have a different graph here. Remember, I always want you to label it the same. If it's always the same, then it'll show consistency in your work. Negative pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 pi. So I need to finish this entire period by 2 pi thirds. That's right there. Although uh, cosine doesn't end at 0, so let me just erase that. Cosine is going to end at 1 half. So start at 1 half, end at 1 half, in the middle of 1 half, and then the middle of the middle, it's 0. So this is really challenging to do. So I would, if it were me... Um, I would probably make all the points first. I can see that it's always up to, and then on this one, it's always going to be in the middle there. And I would do it on the other side too. My chances of just drawing it and staying on track would be super slim. But I don't think I need to add those. I think as long as I have a good sense of shape, I should be able to hit those points naturally. But I did need my maxes and my min. See how you kind of hit those anyway. Okay. So how do I draw secant then? I'm going to make all my asymptotes first. It might be easier... Um, so now I do want to find these points, but they're, they're right there. Actually, I was going to make that thick, but you know what? There's going to be so many of them. I better stick to thin. Whew, right? Okay, so there's another one that if you don't go all the way across, this is really going to be fine. I definitely have a sense that you know what you're doing. And now I'm going to go up with that U, and then down with that U, and then up with that U, down with that U. Normally, how many secants would I fit in the span of 0 to 2 pi? Normally from... Um, 0 to 2 pi, I would be able to do exactly 1. I should be able to do 3 of them. So here's, here's 0, and notice it's starting up. So there's 1, 2, and then 3, only if I end like that. So between 0 and 2 pi, I exactly finish a cycle. I exactly do 3 cycles, if that helps. Okay, another super quick one, this time 4x. So it's going to go four times as fast, but I'm always going to think about sine first. So this is sine of 4x, which sine normally has a period of 2 pi, but I'm going to divide it by 4. So my period is going to be pi halves. So I'm going to start at 0, end at 0, in the middle at 0. I'm going to go up to 1 and down to negative 1. And if you want, you can go all the way across with your dots. It might help you make a nicer graph. Notice I'm not going quite to the end. If it has a really big number like that, I'm okay if you don't. But it is pretty fast to draw once you've got all the dots in there. All right. So now I need asymptotes for um, cosecant, which is whenever this one's zero. It would look like that. And then once you have all your asymptotes in there, then you can go ahead and draw your actual line. It just goes up. And down, up, and down. So it's actually not that hard to draw several of them. 
I'm purposely not trying to make them perfect. I don't want you to think that they have to be perfect. I'm, you know, so if, if look at that one, that's not a great shape, but you get the point. All right, there are still two more to practice on. If you have yet not um, tried one on your own, please do. So first I'm gonna graph y is equal to one third cosine of one half x. I'm always happy when I see that this number is a fraction because as much as I hate doing um, a fraction on the denominator and then having to flip and multiply, when it comes to graphing, I'd rather have a period of four pi. So a period of four pi, when you only go to two pi can be a little tricky for some people. Um, but cosine starts at one third it ends at one third, and at the middle, which is now two pi, it goes to negative one third. And then the middle of the middle, it's zero. Can you follow that? So remember, it would normally go all the way to negative four pi, so two pi is its halfway. So that's where it's gonna be negative one third. And then half of the half is where it's zero. So it's a little tricky, it's gonna be very gradual. like that. Okay, let's draw our secant graph now. You can put the asymptotes at the zeros, and those are the only asymptotes I can see. Now I make my solid line, and it's going to look like this. So I feel like these are harder to figure out, but just easier to draw, or maybe just not as tedious because there aren't a million little u's. Okay, last one. So again, I see cosecant, but I'm going to be thinking about sine. I'm actually going to write sine. And this is one more chance to practice this harder period. So the period is going to be 2 pi over 1 half, which is going to be 4 pi. So I think to myself, sine starts at 0, ends at 0, that's at 4 pi, and is in the middle at 0. And then in the middle of the middle, it's going to go up to 1 and then it would go down to negative one. So on this side, it's gonna go down to negative one. So I'm gonna just make it dotted here. Very slow and lazy because it's only going at half speed. Now I'm gonna make my um, cosecant asymptotes, they're right here. And now I'm gonna make my cosecant graph, which is going to be a U right there, and I can only make one more, a U right there. So we have a few extension questions for you to be thinking about. The first one says, explain why there is more than one tangent function whose graph passes through the origin and has asymptotes at negative pi and pi. So this isn't our typical tangent graph. Ours normally has asymptotes at negative pi halves and um, pi halves, but it looks like this. So it's, the period is twice as, takes twice as long, so it must be y is equal to tangent of one half x. And the question is, um, could this happen again? Is there any other graph besides this one that would actually produce this exact same graph. And that would come from shifting. So if you just shifted it, let's say pi, then it would look like this. But if you shifted it to pi, then it would end up looking exactly the same. So just a little note there that um, while we didn't do shifting today, um, shifting can actually produce an identical graph if you shift it just enough. All right, order the functions from least average rate of change. So there we go again. They've, they've tried to include this in every chapter. Average rate of change is just a fancy name for slope. To the greatest average rate of change over the interval negative pi fourths to pi fourths. So average rate of change is the slope, and pi fourths, remember, is half of pi halves. So it looks like right there, there's that average rate of change. And then this one looks like it goes 
Like that. Pi force for this one is way up here. And then this one, pi force is there. So uh, let's see, from the least. So least would be negative, and this is definitely the most negative, the steepest. So D would be first. And then this one's also negative, but not as steep. So if this were a number, this might be, say, negative 5, but this slope might only be negative 1. So B would be next. And now we have two positive slopes, but this one's not very steep. It might only be like a half. So this one is not as great as this average rate of change, which is much greater. So don't forget, average rate of change just means slope. So on this last one, they're making a point that I actually made earlier, which is sometimes people accidentally think that the period is just a single U. So question three says, what is the period of this graph? Don't forget that it's two of these U's. It goes from zero to what looks like four, but we can check that on this one. Two U's would make a period. So from negative two to two. So the period is definitely four, not just two. So be careful. What is the range of the graph? Notice that there's nothing. It's easy to think all reals because it goes all the way to the top and all the way to the bottom, but it misses this whole middle section. So y is greater than or equal to 2, and y is less than or equal to negative 2. And last, is this function of the form cosecant or secant? Remember that you should be associating cosecant with sine and secant with cosine. And cosine is the one that starts at 1 and ends at 1, where sine starts at 0 and ends at 0, which means sine's asymptotes would fall at zero, where cosecants would fall at pi halves. So this one must be related to sine, which means it is of the form A cosecant Bx. All right, that is it for today. I hope you have a great day.